Alrighty, so um, like I said, welcome everybody. My name is Susan Brown. I'm Vice President of Training at Cameo. Um, I do quite a bit of the webinars and I'm here with Melissa Cruz who holds down the southern end of the state for us in Cameo. <laughs> If you um, haven't done so already, could you please type your name, location, and organization in the chat room? That would be great. And if you're willing to turn on your camera, that would be great also. We will be um, breaking out into small groups because this is an, a hands-on training. We're doing um, an actual like classroom work today. And I think uh, wor working in small groups is helpful to feel engaged so you're not just listening to me go wah, wah, wah the whole time. And I've got three... Um, different P&Ls for you to look at today. To, you, to We're going to be looking at some analyses and on how to apply them in three different cases. So we have case studies. You all should have received an email from Melissa this morning with um, the handouts for today. Um, I really, really, really would love it if you could print out at least the last four pages of that handout because those are our exercises. And I think you're going to get more out of today if you have hard copies sitting in front of you. You can print out the whole handout if you like to take notes on the, the slide deck. Um, so that's your other option, but at least print out the last four pages because I really think it will help you um, get more out of today's training if you can actually scribble on here. And you also just have a pen or pencil and eraser and some kind of calculator on your phone or iPad or wherever you have a calculator because we're doing a little bit of math today as well. So um, with that, I think I will go ahead and get started. And Melissa, uh, just in case anybody needs it, can you put in the um, phone number too for the call just in case sure. the newcomers need it? All right. So welcome, everybody. I am going to start sharing my screen now. Um, I'll just say my name one more time. I'm Susan Brown. I'm the Vice President of Training for Cameo. And Running the meeting today, most of you are on mute, but I will open it up to questions um, along the way. And like I said, we have interactive work to do at the end. We did allow an hour and a half for this meeting because I really wanted time for the exercises. I could certainly get through the material uh, in an hour, but I think where the rubber meets the road and where you all really learn um, is when you can apply this to some case studies and then you, um, it just, you know, you'll walk out of today's webinar with a lot more information. So I hope you can stay with us until 2.30 today. Uh, we are recording this in case you cannot, but um, please, please try. I'm hoping you created that time in your schedule so you'll have time because we'll do the case studies sort of in the second half of the webinar. And it looks like lots of people are joining right now. Again, if you can, please type your name, location, and organization in the chat room that would really help us out knowing who's here today and maybe you can just once people have completely joined melissa maybe you can type that in the chat room again that would be okay. great yeah sure okay so i'm going to start by sharing my screen and getting us going so um let's get started okay so here we are so welcome everybody to um Profit and Loss Analysis from Cameo. We are a trade association based in San Francisco, California that supports the entire small business and micro enterprise field, both the TA and technical assistance providers, as well as the lenders. And we do uh, capacity building, uh, resource development, convening policy and advocacy. Um, and we've really jumped in with this COVID situation to provide you information. I actually developed this whole training for our um, annual uh, micro lenders conference that we do every winter in San Francisco, which got canceled because of the coronavirus. Um, so I didn't recreate it for exactly the coronavirus situation, but we can certainly talk about it and tweak. Uh, I hope we have some time to discuss how you can take some of the analyses I'm presenting today and use them specifically, perhaps as you're helping people um, with the coronavirus impact on their business. So again, my name is Susan Brown. I'm a micro lending CDFI specialist at Cameo and VP of training. And what we're going to do today is uh, do a P&L overview where I tell you basically what a profit and loss statement is. I'm going to talk a little bit about bookkeeping because it, it is the foundation for a quality P&L. 
so I have a few things to say about that. Then our two main analyses we're going to use is trend analysis and margin analysis. And then we'll apply them to three different case studies. And you sh we'll leave here again. If you can stay for the full hour and a half today, I'd really recommend it. And for the newcomers, please print out the last three, four pages of the handout that you received today. It will really help you. Um, so you'll leave knowing what a PL is and how it's structured. You'll have an idea of what a quality PL is and isn't. Because if you are people who work with uh, microenterprises or new startup biz small businesses or perhaps uh, be businesses in disadvantaged communities, you'll find that often people either don't have a PL or if they do, it's not structured properly. So what you need to do is be able to know a, a good quality PL from a poor one so you know whether it makes sense to use these analyses on them. I do have some bookkeeping suggestions for you to help support the development of quality PLs. I'll give you the main indicators of business health that you can use a PL for and talk about how you can help owners with management decisions, um, how the PL can help people with management decisions. And I think that's where we maybe could have an open discussion about the coronavirus where a lot of businesses are either shutting down or needing to do a quick pivot to survive in this situation and how can the PL help? And then we'll um, apply the margin and trend analysis to three companies. I do recommend this knowledge for both lenders and coaches out there in the small business and micro development field. Both community lenders and business coaches should be versed on financial analysis basics. Um, even if your client does has no financial statements, I tell you, you, you will be a better coach and a better lender if you really understand how they work. Um, because you'll actually be able to see finance, you'll see, you, you'll have eyes to see into a business, I think, uh, with a lot more information and knowledge and understanding, even if you don't have uh, financial statements to look at, and you will give better advice, it'll be grounded in, in financial realities of um, business development. And if you, if you are someone that's lending and doing somewhat larger loans, perhaps over $50,000, it's good that you, you know, usually people need um, P&L and maybe a balance sheet once the loans get bigger. So knowing what you're looking at is, is obviously important. So what can financial statements tell us? And by financials at this point, I am talking about a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement. Um, it can tell you if the business is profitable, if it's using the best pricing strategy, which product or service lines or locations are the most profitable. Is the owner managing inventory? Is the owner managing overhead? Is the business growing and how well is it managing growth? Even, like I said, even if a client doesn't have financials, but you understand how to analyze trends and margins, you understand how permanent working capital and the operating cycle work, um, you know how profits get sucked up in a fast growth modality, um, how seasonality and growth impact cash. You will be a better informed coach and certainly a better informed lender. And it is hard to get quality advice if you don't know these financial concepts. I would like to recommend the National Development Council's course called Business Credit Analysis. It's where I got my feet wet really analyzing P&Ls and um, balance sheets. And it's a week long course and they, they have you apply it to a lot of case studies and you definitely come out of that um, class understanding the the whole financial statement thing um, very well for work in this industry. So let's uh, dive in and talk about what is a profit and loss statement. So the profit and loss statement measures revenues and expenses over a defined period of time and that could be uh, one month, one quarter, or one year. Generally, the P&L starts on the first day of the fiscal year. So let's just say that was January 1st for a lot of small businesses, and it closes out the last day of that fiscal year. And then January 1st of the following year, you see your profit and loss starts over again. So it's a, a one-year document that closes out at the end and starts again at the beginning of the new year. It measures profitability, whether the business is making a profit on what it sells. Insights from the P&L can help with reducing expenses, growing revenue, and increasing profit. And most businesses need some kind of income and expense records to file a tax return. They don't need a P&L, but 
it's helpful <laughs> to have a one for your tax return, but there's other ways to get there for taxes if, if your businesses don't have them. So what is the basic profit and loss structure? It's, it's pretty simple and intuitive. It's way more intuitive than um, a balance sheet. It's sales, so sales means revenue, income, whatever you wanna call it, money coming into the business, minus cost of goods sold, which is a type of expense, and we'll talk about that a little more later, which equals gross profit, and we'll talk about what that means, minus overhead, which is another type of expense, equals net profit. So what you have here is income and expenses um, subtracting out two different types of expenses equals net profit. So pretty simple. Most people can get their head around it, which makes it a great tool to use with people, with your clients who maybe don't have a back, big background in um, financial statements. So let's just define a few of the terms here. Income equals sales equals revenue. Um, those terms are generally used interchangeably. Um, and it's revenue, we're really talking about money earned from the sale of goods and services. Um, it also can include some things like interest or maybe some other things that your businesses earn money on, but mostly we're talking about the money coming in from whatever they're in business to sell. Cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold is a type of expense. It's just a particular type of expense. If these are expenses incurred, that are directly associated with the product or service delivery for that sales period. So that means direct material and labor that went into the goods or products sold for that quarter, month, or year. It's also sometimes called variable expense as it varies with sales. So on the one hand, this is a really great thing to know about cost of goods sold, but it's a very hard thing for small and micro businesses to do. So for manufacturing, if you're making a product, if you've got a bakery or somebody who's selling uh, pottery or any businesses like that where they're making a product, cabin, cabinetry makers or furniture makers, um, it's going to be their direct materials, again, the wood, the flour, you know, whatever that went into the product they're making. Any direct labor, if they're actually hiring someone to help them make or build whatever they're selling, the product they're selling, and perhaps some of the shipping costs would be included in cost of goods sold. Um, for retail, it's the wholesale cost of inventory plus shipping. Service businesses usually don't have cost of goods sold, but in some cases, labor and other costs directly associated with service delivery can be cost of goods sold. So for example, I am a consultant and if I get a contract and I'm gonna hire someone to subcontract with me, what I pay them would probably be considered cost of goods sold, even though I'm a service business. Now, the, um, the hard part of cost of goods sold is that, uh, first of all, most businesses cannot track cost of goods sold because they're really not tracking inventory and sales with the kind of specificity you need to know what, because remember, cost of goods sold is, let's say I have um, a baking business and I sell loaves of bread if I wanted to know my cost of goods sold for a given day, for example, it would be the flour, butter, yeast, whatever, salt that went into the loaves of bread that I sold just that day, not how much inventory is sitting back in the pantry waiting to be made into bread and sold in a week or two or three. So when you think about it, uh, the, the businesses that can track cost of goods sold well are ones that have really good inventory systems, point of sale systems, and can really manage their inventory and know what's going out the door at a regular basis. Now, most of our small businesses really can't do this. So while I'm going to be teaching you how to use cost of goods as an analytic tool today, it is tough to come across businesses, small businesses and nascent businesses that even have the ability to track this accurately. A lot of businesses, um, I'm on the third bullet here, only calculate maybe once per year their, their year end inventory with an inventory count. Um, for tax purposes, and that might be the only kind of inventory management count that they do at any given time, because they literally just don't have the time and know how to do it, you know, some other way. Now, for many, many, many small businesses, this last bullet point is pertinent, because if a business turns over its inventory every 30 days, it kind of doesn't matter. If you're, if you're buying flour, you know, every 30 days and you sell all that 
you use all that flour up in finished product that you sell every 30 days, then you're turning over your inventory every 30 days and your inventory sales kind of equal your cost of goods sold sales. But for anybody who has a backlog of inventory that lasts several months, then usually what they sell in a given month isn't going to match their, their total inventory purchases in a given month. So that's where you can run into problems using this analy analytically if that matching of inventory with sales isn't available to you. So that leaves us with gross profit. So sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. So this is a great, again, it's a wonderful tool to have if it's available. It demonstrates the ability to control direct production costs, purchasing, labor, materials. It indicates the viability of pricing. And it's one of the best measures to help product-based businesses become more profitable. So if, you could, if you've got this tool, like, oh, let me teach you how to use it because it can really help a business. Overhead is, again, that sometimes called fixed expenses. It's just all the ongoing expenses of operating business, rent, phone, marketing, website, insurance, all those just day-to-day, -day everything that's not a, a direct um, input into a product or service. Usually it doesn't vary much or all with changes in sales. And, and the only time it takes a big jump is if um, a business decides to get into a bigger space or go from a home base to a business, to a retail or commercial space. That's when your overhead can do these, these large jumps. Or if for some reason you're hiring some new employees, those kinds of things can make inventory, excuse me, overhead jump. So that leaves net profit after you subtract or loss, <laughs> after you subtract out your um, overhead, you're left with your net profit and loss. And I think, I set this up as sort of a training for sole proprietor because again, we're at Cameo, we really do want to support micro enterprises and disadvantaged communities and business owners, women, minorities, um, all of that. And generally they, their, their most common legal structure is the sole proprietor. So, um, Net profit has to cover a lot. And so that's why whenever you do get to the bottom line of net profit uh, with, a, with one of your clients, you have to just keep this list in mind that it not only covers owner's draw, which is the money that you can take out of your business to go pay your personal expenses, your own, you know, your home rent or food for the family and all that kind of thing. Um, it also covers often some future expansion like new equipment or an increasing inventory. It covers the principal portion of the loan payment. Uh, we'll cover that a little bit more, but there's some cash expenses that don't show up on a P&L and the um, principal portion of a loan payment is one of them. If your client is making enough money to pay income taxes, your, your, your net profit has to cover that. Again, if, you're, if your client's in a growth mode or a pivoting mode and is investing money, like inventory or equipment um, buy, or buying in bulk, it can, a lot of net profit even, so your, your business can be profitable, a, a business owner can be profitable, but run out of cash because they're in fast growth and they're buying a lot of stuff to keep up with expansion. And then of course, personal expenses. So it's good to remember how much, it's almost like net profit is a pie. You could almost create a pie chart with it and say part of it goes to you and part of it goes to inventory, part of it goes to taxes and part of it goes to the you know, cash expenses that don't show up on the P&L and all that kind of thing. So it's helpful for, to teach your clients that and for you to understand that as well when you look at a P&L. So um, here's some things that, and I will pause for a minute and answer questions. Let me just get through a couple more slides. Here's what should not be on a P&L. And as I said, this slide, which is slide 16, I think on my slide deck, refer, you might need to refer to this slide deck for during today's exercises. Um, personal income taxes or personal expenses should not be on a business P&L. Sales tax should not be there. It should be sitting over on the balance sheet. sheet. Sales tax is just a pass through. It's something business owners collect on behalf of the government and just hand over to the government on a monthly or quarterly basis. Owners draw for sole proprietorships. Now, if your businesses have LLCs and they may have um, salary that they're pulling from the business and it shows up under, you know, officer wages or payroll or whatever. But for sole proprietorships, owners draw should not show. 
the principal portion of debt surface because only the interest portion is an expense on a P&L. Ideally, again, this gets back to our cost of goods sold. Ideally, inventory purchases that aren't going to be used up in the next 30 days will not show up as a cost of goods sold expense, but this may or may not be possible with your client. Um, new loan capital should not show up on a P&L and equity infusions should not. Many of these things live over in, on the balance sheet. Um, so a P&L, you can't do, we can't do the analyses we're going to do today on a P&L full of errors. That's why it's good for you to know whether you're looking at one that looks clean or not. Um, common expense errors you can see on the previous slide. We'll look at a sort of error ridden P&L today and a couple of clean ones so that you'll start to have a better eye for when you can use these analyses and when you can't. And if you're looking at a P&L with lots of mistakes, then we're really going back to helping them recast their bookkeeping so that their P&L is clean. And um, the other thing about P&Ls, I really recommend, especially for small business, that you keep them to one page. And the usual culprit when you have a two-page P&L is there's excessive accounts that are duplicative, incorrect, or they're just, they create account after account for every little expense that shows up and they've got way too many of them for all these little itty bitty expenses. So I think what I'd like to do is stop sharing for a minute and just check in with the chat room and see, oh, yeah, see if there's any questions over there. I have one question from um, Gloria Glasgow. She's asking, um, What's the name of the financial statement analysis certification that you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar? Oh, yes. Let me write that in. It's called um, NDC or National Development Council, and it's their business credit analysis course. I just stuck it in the chat room. National Development Council business credit analysis. And the National Development Council has a whole certification pro um, program with various uh, courses. This is just one of their courses, and it really teaches you um, a lot. Were there any other questions? If you can, go ahead, I think, and just unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question, or you can type it into the chat room. Yeah, I have a question. Is that sure, okay? Sure. Yes, please. Just introduce yourself with your name and organization, please. Oh, I'm uh, Bill. I'm Bill yes. from uh, SBDC. So, oh, which SBDC, just... Bill? Which one? Um, several. Um, oh, several. Okay. In, in the Bay Area, yeah. Okay, cool. So I was wondering what, about um, merchant fees and and cost of goods. Mhm. Mm yep, I would call that a cost of goods sold, because it's for a percentage what? of the sale, right? Right. Mhm. Mm well, for internet companies, it's a cost of goods sold, right? Because they 100% go uses credit cards. 100% of the purchases, right? I mean, what do you? How do you usually do that? Is there a rule? Yeah, no, I would say merchant fees, which for those who don't know, that's the percentage credit card companies charge to collect sales upon your behalf. Um, and so, yeah, merchant fees, whether they're one, two, three, I can't remember what they are, one, two, three percent would definitely be cost of goods sold because they're direct hit on their expense directly associated with sales. So when you're setting up QuickBooks, if anybody knows uh, QuickBooks, you would create an account um, if you'd like, you could create an account called Merchant Fees and then you tag it as a cost of goods sold type of account and then QuickBooks will know how to put it in the right place. But it's not commonly, I think a lot of times it's put as a operating expense though. I know. Well, that's what you, you're going to see in a minute in your packet. There's, there's, uh, there's P&Ls all over the place that aren't set up properly. Okay. So often when you work with a client and you start to see that they've, they've put things in the balance sheet on the P and L, excuse me, that shouldn't be there or they put it in the wrong place. That's time. That's the time to have a discussion with them and say, Hey, um, did you set this up or did you get help setting this up? And why did you put this here? And, you know, start having that dialogue so you can maybe straighten it out. Um, if it is an overhead, it's one of the things, at least in QuickBooks, which is the only really bookkeeping system I personally know, uh, it's easy to change it from an overhead account to a cost of goods sold account. There's some things that are very hard to change in QuickBooks, but that one you can pop up into the right category if um, you find it in the wrong place. Okay. Now, now one other thing, though. So is there a, a ratio for depreciation to sales that 
the business should shouldn't overinvest so the depreciation is too high. Is it, do you have a ratio for that or no? No, I've never heard of a ratio for that. And depreciation really is based on um, an, a business's investment in fixed assets of one kind or another because you depreciate fixed assets, right? Is that what you're talking about, Bill? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the only thing I'd say about fixed assets is you really want to advise uh, young and small businesses to be super lean and mean on fixed assets. It's, you know, fixed assets are sort of like a necessary evil, you might say, financially, and they can suck up a lot of capital. And unless they're a very productive fixed asset, you want to minimize how much money is put into there. And there are, I have worked with business owners who got advice from their accountants because accountants, not all, but some are very fixated on getting tax liability down. And they'll actually advise business owners to go invest in fixed assets just as a write-off when in fact it's using up precious capital and it's not an asset they really need. So there is no ratio about depreciation. I think the rule about fixed assets is just do your best when working with clients to say, do you really need this? Will it be productive? Is it gonna help you be either more efficient or increase sales or you know, whatever? What, what kind of efficiency bump or production bump can we get that we can really bring to the bottom line? Well, well no, the reason I said it, because a restaurant spent $2 million on a build out and their sales were 2.5 million. And it was, wasn't, that's not a good, that's too much. Well, it really depends on their revenues. And I think, like I said, restaurants are, unfortunately, are one of those businesses that go out of business relatively quickly. Okay. And um, so you kind of have to help them understand how, you know, it works. It's not an easy industry to stay afloat in. And I think, again, what happens with restaurants is they can sometimes maybe get very um, enamored with re, you know, remodeling and leasehold improvements, spend a ton of capital on that, not have enough money for working capital, and then find themselves either with sales that don't really cover whatever investment they put into it or to keep up with their overhead. So I think that's more what you want to look at and not really depreciation ratios or anything like that. No, that's good. Th thanks, thanks. Sure. Um, Anything else? Okay, I see something, yeah. Cost of goods sold are also known as direct expenses. The merchant processes are not direct expenses. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, we can always have a debate about it. <laughs> I could go do some research, right? But I personally think anything that's a, a direct cost of making a sale should be cost of goods sold, but yeah. All right, should we go back? Let's go back and keep going here with the presentation. So what's next? Okay, so it does all start with bookkeeping. You know, you can't do analysis without bookkeeping, um, a good bookkeeping system and bad numbers or no numbers really, uh, not only can you not apply the analysis we're talking about today, but you know, your business really is kind of flying blind. However, that's really what all micro enterprises and small business startups do. They, they don't spend a lot of time often on bookkeeping. It's getting easier every day. I looked in several years ago, I looked into something called Xero and, I, and um, perhaps even QuickBooks Online does this now, where you could kind of manage it all on your phone and take pictures of your receipts and you know, invoice people from your phone. And it's getting easier for uh, you know, a, a you know, phone-based company to keep decent records it's still just um, often not done or just not done accurately or consistently enough. Um, unfortunately though, without them, you know, your business owner doesn't really have a way to really analyze their pricing and product selection, uh, analyzing on how to set up contracts, leases, equipment that's too expensive or doesn't increase profitability, just what I was talking about with Bill. Um, you can make really unfortunate, unfortunate financing decisions, either taking on too much debt, debt that's structured wrong, debt that's too expensive. I mean, unfortunately, without these tools, it's very hard to make some good um, business decisions. And as we know, most of the people going into business, again, who are, are new at it, love their product or service, but are not business managers and finance managers. And so they're, they're struggling often to keep up with um, the financial side of their business, even if they understand their product and service pretty well. So I just thought I'd give you a few tips for those of you who work with 
if, if you don't know QuickBooks or some other bookkeeping system, I really recommend you go and learn one of them, you know, learn zero. And if anybody knows of a good um, bookkeeping app, please FreshBooks. Uh, I work with somebody who uses FreshBooks, which looks pretty nice. QuickBooks, zero. Please put it in chat right now if you've got a good experience with um, a bookkeeping system, because again, to be a lender or a TA provider and really have no idea how bookkeeping works and how to set somebody up properly, it's very hard to do uh, the financial statement analysis and I think be a grounded um, coach or lender. So just in QuickBooks, you know, uh, what's really easy to fix is you can change the type of account, which again, I, I think I was mentioning to Bill, you can pop something from, you know, being an overhead expense to a cost of goods sold expense. You can merge accounts pretty easily. You're, we're going to look at an example today where there's like so many duplicative accounts and the first there's a bunch of things we need to fix with this business, but one of them you can do is just merge the accounts together when they've gotten too many. You can eliminate sub accounts. Like I said, most one of the most common errors when people have set up their own books is that they just go account happy. Every time they turn around, they create a new account and there's just too many of them. Um, you can add this thing called a, you can add class or customer functions, which means you can sort. And I'll actually show you an example today that has the class functionality turned on in QuickBooks. And it allows you to look at a company by job or by division or major product line, things like that, or location. It's a way to start to say, where am I profitable? And where, you know, did I make money on the Jones job and lose money on the Smith job? You know, it's, it's a way to start to fine tune. And that's easy to set up in QuickBooks. You can split transactions between different accounts. You can change, um, like I said, you can change accounts if something just got filed as, uh, over, as office supplies and it really should be telephone or whatever, you can do that easily. And, and P&L issues are pretty easy to fix um, in QuickBooks. Where we run into problems are things that are a little bit more uh, balance sheet based. Again, sales tax and payroll errors, I mean, and when I ran into people who'd made a mash of that, I just said, look, I, I, I don't have the chops to correct it because it take a lot of time. There are people probably who can. It just seems like it would be expensive. Um, also, getting people switching to QuickBooks payroll mid-year, I found really challenging. Sales information that's already been deposited and was booked wrong or you can't track it. A lot of... Um, Small businesses have cash sales, so they do a really bad job of saying, I got the sale from from where and I deposited it on this date. And you kind of have to keep track of where your sales are coming from and what sales you're depositing on any given day to, to work with QuickBooks easily and reconcile your checking account and things like that. So sales information that's not documented is pretty tough. Um, the balance sheet accounts, if they get messed up, again, those almost notoriously are messed up because people don't understand them. I found those hard to straighten out. If you just have hundreds of errors over years, you know, it's just too much and equity mistakes um, can be hard. So whenever I came across, uh, for a few years, I was helping people set up their books um, on QuickBooks and I would just say, hey, we got to start over. <laughs> so that was my solution to having problems um, in QuickBooks. So let me just see what my next slide is. Oh yeah, so here's some suggestions that I came up with when I was doing this. Is QuickBooks and maybe some other bookkeeping systems do recommend, they, they say, oh, you're a XYZ type of business. Here's a suggested chart of accounts. I always thought QuickBooks chart of accounts was just really overkill, too many of them. And again, I thought they were duplicative. So I would say either build your own or edit uh, the suggested chart of accounts and get it lean and mean Eliminate all those overlapping expense accounts. Um, don't use expense accounts to create detail. QuickBooks has a great reporting function, a transaction reporting uh, function. You can get all kinds of detail from the reports capacity. You don't need to create account after account after account. So um, don't do it. Um, Eliminate any sub accounts that you don't need. You really don't, do you really need to know how to create a sub account for electricity versus oil versus, you know, whatever, propane. Um, I think you can just have a utilities account and you can use your transactions accounts to get detail if you really have to know vendor by vendor what you're spending money on. Um, I've seen miscellaneous accounts with as much as $6,000 in them. So I don't, I don't recommend that one. It's like, what the heck is that? 
oh, I saw I missed one. Use cost of goods sold if it's at all doable. If you feel like it's, don't, don't assign a small business owner some monumental accounting task. Just keep it easy for them. And if it looks too hard, just say, look, never mind. Just stick it under inventory and we'll deal with it later. And again, keep your P&L to one page because I feel like it's hard to see the forest for the trees if it gets long and messy. Um, so I'm going to pause it again because here we're going to jump into analysis. So let me stop sharing and again see. Is there any, did anybody put stuff in chat as to? Um... Yeah, um, Victoria mentioned mm -hmm. that she uses Zoho books. And oh, she I haven't them. heard of that. Yeah, and QuickBooks Online. Yeah, yeah. So those are some uh, accounting softwares that you can use. Um, or Waldo mentioned Ask My Accountant account. Yeah, Ask My Accountant is an accounting QuickBooks. Like if you, you could train your business owners to use that because what it means is if something new shows up and they don't know what it is, is this, is this an asset? Is it liability? Is it on the balance sheet? Is it in the P&L? You know, where does this belong? They can just put it in there and then select this ask my accountant thing. And then what it does is it kind of puts it in the special category and then you can go sort through those later and, and assign them properly. So that's, that is a good, a good use. Mm -hmm. So um, any other questions? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question or we just keep going? Okay, I'll just keep going. So what is P&L analysis? What can we do? So um, it means analyzing historic performance. So projections, I hope many of you are using cash flow projections with your new and growing businesses. And that's where you really analyze future. You're trying to figure out what's possible in the future and make some good decisions there. But P&L analysis is about um, analyzing the past. It detects positive or negative trends in a company's past performance. It helps the business owner improve performance by identifying opportunities or issues and helps determine the ability to pay new debt service. For those of you who are lenders um, on the call, it is a way we, when I teach, I teach a class called Micro Lending Essentials, which is how to underwrite micro loans. And uh, when we have a P&L, we do use it to see if the if a borrower can take on some additional new loans and manage the monthly um, loan payment. So here are the, the key P&L indicators. So of course we want to see sales growing. So um, as you'll see in a minute, we're going to look at trend analysis where you compare a business to itself over time. And if you look at last two years ago versus last year versus this year, you can see our sales growing. Um, obvious, but of course you have to be tracking sales to kind of know if they're growing, but it's a good thing to look at. Now cost of goods sold, which remember is an expense directly associated with um, production of a, of a product we want that stable or falling. And the reason we want cost of goods sold stable or falling is it usually means the, if it's stable, it means you're managing your purchases and your production process and your pricing well to maintain your gross profit margin. If it's falling, it means you're actually doing better with every sale as, as, as cost of goods sold falls over time, you're making more money out of every sale. So we want to see cost of goods sold over time stable or falling. We want to see gross profit at the very least stable, but ideally rising. So that means, again, out of every dollar of sales you have, after you take care of your direct expenses for uh, creating a product or service, you are, you are taking more and more money to the gross product line. Overhead, which is, again, all those just regular monthly expenses. Again, we'd like to see that stable or falling and net profit rising. So net profit, we, again, we want to see a net, enough net profit to pay owner's draw taxes, expansion plans, and existing debt. So this will, again, remember, keep remembering that sort of pie-shaped net profit that covers a lot of different things. So the P&L can provide insight. You know, it really, it, successful integration of growth, employees, commercial rent, new large contracts to a new location, there's a lot of ways you can uh, 
look at a P&L, especially if you know how to help people set up good reports. If you set up their P&L company right on QuickBooks or whatever the bookkeeping system is, and you create reports for them that track some of this stuff, they can print out reports every month and kind of see how they're doing. And it's, it's really great to see if they've made good choices along the way. It also provides, like I said, um, information for the global cash analysis for underwriting microloans and even some small business loans. And with proper bookkeeping report design, it can support strategic man management decisions about pricing, product lines, locations, employees, I mean, on and on. It really can be a great um, tool for making business decisions. So here's what, here's the first one we look at, which is trend analysis. It compares a business progress to itself over time. And it measures progress by looking at total sales expenses and net profit in terms of dollars. Analysis comes through comparison of this month or year to last month or year. So you're saying I did I, so far between, let's say January 1st and April 28th, I did X, you know, I sold this much, my expenses were this much, I can compare it to the exact same four months last year and see how I'm doing. Am I, are my sales the same or, or worse? Are my expenses the same or, or, you know, less or more? You know, how am I doing in terms of managing all these moving parts in my business um, from year to year? How am I doing on that? Um, so to conduct uh, trend analysis, we create spreadsheets placing annual P&Ls or monthly P&Ls side by side. Or you can generate these reports uh, from uh, your bookkeeping system. And if you guys are interested, I did open uh, my desktop QuickBooks on my computer and I can show you how to get to a P&L um, in QuickBooks and how to turn on the trend analysis in the report function. So just if you want that, write it in the chat room and I'd be happy to show that to you and I'll be sure to um, do that before we go today. So margin analysis is a little different. That's where you convert P&L numbers into percentages of total sales for a more complete analysis. And these are the formulas you use. You take cost of goods sold divided by sales. You take gross profit divided by total sales. You take overhead divided by total sales. You take net profit divided by total sales. And that gives you your margins or percentages. And it really helps you to compare because sometimes when a business is growing radically and changing things, it's hard to tell if they're managing all these moving parts, just looking at the dollars. Sometimes looking at percentages gives you a lot more insight to how the business is doing. And one of the businesses we look at today, you'll see that the margin analysis, I think is where you have the most ability to kind of figure out what's going on with the business. So let's start with ABC gift card company. It is um, in your packet. I think it would be page 17 or something like that. And um, I, I do kind of call it here. If I move to it, you see, I call it bad company. <laughs> this is a real p and I got called to this business and um, this was their p and And I printed it out and saved it because it was a great example of um, what sometimes you find when you go into a client's QuickBooks and you, you see what they've done and you've got to decide, is this a quality P&L or not? And if it's not, what's wrong with it? Can I help them fix this and clean it up or do we need to start over? So I am going to start, stop sharing. I hope you can all find this in your packets. And I see people want me to show you. I will show you that QuickBooks thing. Just remind me, somebody remind me before we go. So what I would really like to do is put you into small groups and I hope you have your ABC, you know, gift card. I will tell you it's a gift card company and I'll show you, I want you to work in small groups and find everything that you think breaks one of the rules of, of quality p ls that I pointed out today and see if you can find them. And I'll tell you, let me show you my, this is my copy of it. You can see how many things I found. <laughs> I counted once, I think there's 40 or 50 things. So there's no shortage of mistakes to find here. And I'm hoping you can all work in small groups. If you can turn on your camera, it's kind of helpful for your group partners. I think I'll put you in groups of four and turn on your, unmute yourselves. And I'll give you just maybe about five or six minutes to work together. And then we'll come back and discuss it and see what everybody found. Okay. 
So let me, takes me a minute to set up the breakout rooms. Let me, I'm going to put you into groups of four. I think that will work. Uh, let me do one more. Yeah, three to four participants per room. And if you have questions, um, just hang in there because honestly, I think, um, just bring your questions back to me as opposed to raising your hand and asking me to join your room, okay? So I'm gonna time it for about um, six, seven minutes um, and please work with your group to find as many errors as you can. How do you know if you're in a group? You're gonna be actually just put in one automatically. So hold on, I'm just finishing up here. I'll give you guys about, let me try um, seven minutes because we're doing pretty well on time. So you should just be put and you'll get a 60 second warning that your group is going to close, that your time is up and your group is going to come back to the main room. Okay. Andrew, can you hear me? I'm sorry, you came late and we've got people in a... Um... Yes, hello, this is Andrew. <laughs> yeah, you know, you joined right when I put everybody into small groups. <laughs> so oh, okay, I, I was wondering if... <laughs> well, yeah. like, what's happening? Um, did you get the handout from today in your email box? Um, no, so I, I just saw an announcement of this minutes ago, and then I realized, it, you know, I think this went out yesterday, the, the, the message that I saw, and I, I realized it was happening right now. So I just thought I would pop in and see, okay. <laughs> see where the session was at. So let me ask you to do two things. One, can you put your name and organization in the chat room and maybe your email address? Sure. And I think Melissa, you could send him the handout right now, couldn't you? And just so you know, Andrew, we're going until um, 2.30 today, so it's an hour and a half. She, we're working on the first exercise in the handouts, and if you put that in the chat room, Melissa should be able to um, send you the handouts. And then you can also, you know, look at the recording. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Hang in there. People will be back in a few minutes from the okay. the check the small group rooms. Okay. Okay. Well, is the the entire session is recorded that I could like watch from the beginning later? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. But you may <laughs> want to hang out for the discussion. I think it's kind of it often is kind of robust, especially if you have a question. But sure. It's a, it's certainly up to you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, just sent the handout to you, Andrew. We have so somebody check. else coming in from the wait. <laughs> no. Okay, go ahead and admit her. It's okay. I admitted her, but she disappeared. Yeah, that happens. It's interesting. Yeah. I don't know why sometimes people have a, they have a hard time um, getting into the rooms and stuff. <laughs> I don't know.
be right back, Susan. I'm just going to get yep. some water. Yeah, we have about three or four more minutes to go. Sure. Did you get the, did you by any chance get the um, email yet, Andrew? Does it come through? I don't think you? so. I I just got um, like a message confirming that I just registered for the session. Oh, okay. But I, I don't see the, any new attachments. Oh, here it is. Okay. Just arrived. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So open that up and then go to like page 17 or so it should be this thing called abc company profit and loss statement okay and if you have you know what we're looking for are errors and mistakes that would this is not a quality pnl and you can't do analysis on a on a, a messed up pnl so i just wanted people to start looking for all the errors in this document sure. so that they would be able when working with clients be able to do some assessment about whether it's a you know PL that um, has legs or really just can't be used for analysis purposes and also to help give people feedback on how to set up their uh, you know bookkeeping mm -hmm. if they're making a bunch of errors which is pretty common okay So I hope this works, Melissa. I set it up where they're just going to automatically be kicked back in here in about two more minutes. Mm. So I'm still, um, wow, there's more people joining. Yeah. Oh, it's the same woman, Veronica. Yeah, I'm still trying to get in. Yeah. Oh. What's going on there? Yeah. Andrew, what, where, where are you located? Yeah, I'm, I'm at a, it's called Northwest Side Community Development Corp. We're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, cool. And, okay. and we're a CDFI and um, a CDC. And uh, so I, I do grant writing oh. mostly, but we have a, a lender on staff and we do a few other things as well. Oh, cool. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I need to write down this Zoho books. I have never heard of that. It's like a, well, I'm not sure. I know Zoho is a CRM, a customer relationship management system. Okay. All right, so people are gonna come back here in a minute. Okay. Let's see if they have things to say, I'm hoping. One sec. It's only the second time I've used the breakout room, so I'm always like, oh, keep my fingers crossed that everyone's yeah. going to get back, okay. <laughs> you have just 15 more seconds, and then everyone should pop back in. Okay. Oh, Alex, it looks like you're someplace nice outside. Yeah, my patio is pretty nice. I enjoy it. Got some it. sunshine and greenery. That's wonderful. Yeah, I try to be out here as much as possible, especially with the quarantine. I'm home all the time. I like to... Yeah, get some fresh air, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Can it, does anyone want to offer a couple ideas that their group came up with of mistakes on this PL? Can you unmute yourself and volunteer some ideas? Uh, everything? No, yeah, well, come on, let's be specific. Yeah, there's a uh, the loan, there's they included investment. the loan payments, uh, which uh, only the interest should have been included. They included multiple loan payments. Um, so that should have just been interest, not the actual loan payment. Gold star there. Who else? Everyone just, if you can, just say one thing if you want to. Ro Rosalinda, did you have one? Yeah, the new equipment should be in the balance sheet. It should, it should, depreciate. It should be depreciated. It shouldn't be expense. Right, right. You shouldn't have a petty cash expense. That's right. But where does petty cash belong? Petty cash Assets. is a balance sheet. Balance, balance sheet, sheet account. account. It's an asset. Petty cash is kind of like a little bank account. 
that you put over on your balance sheet and just use for small items. Yeah. So it, it can be, end up sort of like that miscellaneous account where who knows what's happening in there. We, we don't want that to happen. If they have a petty cash account, they got to reconcile that thing. <laughs> right. What mm -hmm. else? I would say float, um, pay, yeah. and uh, it was a negative balance. I'm not sure what that was. Or I know. I, I, my no, guess is, I don't know what that is either, but if you mm -hmm. can't even understand what something is, then you got to do mm -hmm. something about it, right? Right. <laughs> what else? They have a printing and reproduction uh, expense that should be cost of goods, shouldn't it? Yeah, so let's talk about that, because that's one, this is a, this is a, um, you know, a, a greeting card kind of company. And you can see they do have cost of goods, right, right of 10,000 something, uh -huh. and then they have printing and reproduction of 46,000. So chances are they're just expensing their entire run. And I know this company would get their, I think their cards printed in China or something like that, and then have them shipped over. And ideally, this is a company that doesn't just expense, you know, a year's worth of inventory in one fell swoop, that it's somehow tracking sales as you go, and that most of this is inventory that should be on the balance sheet. But in any case, it shouldn't be in overhead. It should always be in cost of goods sold. So there's well, a bunch of problems there. What I would say is, depending on what kind of printing is it, so, so if they are printing office supply, uh, you know, office documents but it's a substantial amount it's a material amount so we know it belongs to the to the cost of goods sold because the, it's a substantial amount now if it was a thousand dollars we know it could be an expense but because it's so i mean that that would be my first question if i see that this this p l you know why right. because well, it's, especially it's if you know it's a greeting high. card company a greeting card exactly. company is going to have some big printing expenses and so mm -hmm. chances are that's what that is and and what else do you guys see who else has a insight they're willing to share who hasn't spoken oh and by group, the way oh, oh please go sorry on. carolyn go ahead um so our group it's petty but uh saw that under gross profit and then expense that they had a duplicate um liability insurance lines mm -hmm. um, well I don't think it's petty because if you look at mine and I have all these little, these little, um, let's see if you can see them, these little archy things right here. Those were all the, all the various accounts that I thought should be combined, right? Yes. So one of the things that's on here is this, this P&L breaks my rule of a one page P&L. Uh -huh. Largely, it has a ton of stuff that should be on the balance sheet or that should be combined. And this could easily be a one page P&L, right? Much easier for the human brain to get their head around a one-page document. You will actually be a more useful tool. Anything else? Um, more things, I'm not then we'll move on. I'm not sure if somebody um, mentioned about the the case the, the the they're inconsistent. Like there are a lot of upper cases and <laughs> yes. yeah. I mean mm -hmm. they should be consistent. Like yeah. You know. I think they should. I think they should be consistent too. Again, it's, it's a lot of this is about how can I have this document be something that registers in my brain. And I think when the formatting's all wonky, it's harder just to like, look at it. I do want to point out some big ones like sales tax eh, that should be over on the balance sheet. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the loan no, payment. I, I, yeah. Pardon? The capital loan payment. Yeah, the loan payments only interest is is expense. Uh, so, yeah. And if I actually look at capital loan payments, I don't know if those are payments or capital infusion. I don't even. I can't even tell what half of this stuff is. Plus, it's more than one year, and the P and L can only be one year. And um, you know, website they have website domain fees of twenty six hundred dollars. I mean, like I don't know what you guys pay for a website domain, but mine's about ten bucks a year. So you know, you get the idea. But I didn't make this one up. This was a client's p &L, So I just wanted to use it to show you that it's your job to see, is this a quality p &L? Can I use it for analysis? Or are we needing to go back and clean up all the bookkeeping in order to uh, have, have something usable? OK? So let's go on. And actually, let me do give you a little more information. And then we'll, um, 
I think, let me, let me make sure, hold on, let me share my screen here for a minute and go back to, oh, I hate this one. I can't remember which, um, yeah, so here's, this is ABC Bad Company, yeah, and you guys all saw that, so let me, uh, let me go back here. You, you so, know. so let's just finish this out and say, what would you recommend to a business owner who showed you this P&L? What would people say? Hire a bookkeeper. Hire a bookkeeper. What else? You might even have to need to hire an accountant. I mean, somebody really needs to set their business up properly and they probably just need to start over fresh, right? I, don't, I think mm -hmm. this had way too many errors to uh, clean up. Okay. And then you would also say to them, look, I would love to do some analysis with you, but we can't use this document for that because it, it's, not, it's not clean enough for us to be able to really understand what's going on with your business. And it also just might give you an idea that the, the owners of this company are just really kind of lost financially mm -hmm. and that you want to do a deep dive on what kind of financial skills they need to make their business profitable. And also they, they lost a lot of money. They lost 37000 And... Um, and that 46,000 is still is an item that I would like to dig in for. I yeah, will exactly. ask for a general ledger. I would like, let me see your books. Let me see your general ledger and try to see well, what is I, the detail on that $46,000. Okay. I don't know if they'd have a general ledger and we don't know if they lost money because I think they're expensing a bunch of inventory that's not sold, but that's the problem. So you, you get the picture. We could spend all day on this, but just for people who are new, we're going to 230 today. So we have two more case studies to do and I want to make sure we get to them. But this was just to give you a feel for what is, you know, likely for you to see out there in the field. Um, so the next thing I wanted to do is uh, show you a retail store with two locations. So this P&L was created using this function in QuickBooks called classes that can separate income and expense by either location, division, or product line. And so I just made up this company in QuickBooks and said it had two stores, two locations. And the, the scenario we're using is that, um, let's say the owner has two, a manager at each, each store has its own manager and the manager has the ability to make a lot of decisions for that store. So if you look on your handouts, you'll see that uh, you have store one and store two in total for, um, let's say, I don't know, let's say this is a month's worth of sales. And what you see here are the margins, right? So these margins are calculated. So if you take, if you can see on my screen right now, I have $6,800 here in store one cost of goods sold. And if you take 6,800 and divide it by 13,000, you'll get 52.31%. Okay. So remember, those are our formulas. Again, if you take gross profit of 6,200 and you divide it by 13,000, you'll get 47 or 48%. So that's the formula. You take, you take each one of these expenses and divide it by total sales and it gives you a percentage. So let's just spend a few minutes talking about this. So remember, what do we want to see cost of goods sold? So first of all, the sales are relatively the same between the two companies. So just on sales alone, excuse me, the two locations, on, on sale, just on sales alone, you can't really tell like which store is doing better. So let's dig into the expenses and see what we can find out. And what, somebody tell me what you want to see. What was our good trend for um, cost of goods sold? What do we want to see cost of goods sold being? Stable or falling. Stable or falling. Right. So which one of these companies, excuse me, I call them companies. Which one of these locations has the better cost of goods sold figure? Store one. Store one. And is that because you looked at 6,800 or because you looked at the 52%? Both. Well, both. And look at their sales aren't equal. So even if their cost of goods sold as a percentage of sale was exactly the same, their number, their dollar figure is going to be different, right? Because their sales are a little bit different. So I think you really can't compare how each store is doing unless you look at the percentage. And so store one is doing quite a bit better. It has a lower cost of goods sold, which means, what does it mean about its gross, gross profit? If cost of goods sold is lower, gross profit is what? Increase. It's right? higher. It's higher, right. 
So another way to look at these percentages, if your mind doesn't like like percentages, is you can say in store one, for every dollar of sales, they bring 48 cents to the gross profit line. Whereas for every dollar of sales in store two, they bring about 41 cents to the gross profit line. So store one, you know, brings seven cents more out of every dollar to the gross profit line. And that may not seem a lot, but in a small business, a, a gap like that can make a huge difference on the bottom line in profitability. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So if, if these were my two companies, would you, would you mostly be looking at the rent and the payroll discrepancy? Like if you were, if you I would were look at all to... of it. So we just got through cost of goods sold and I'll scroll down here for the overhead numbers. So here we have the overhead numbers also vary. And so somebody tell me what you see that stands out to you that's worth noting in the overhead number. So at what my answer to your question, I'm sorry, I don't, if you could tell me your name, I didn't hear, I didn't, can't see. Oh, it's, it, it's Carolyn. I was, oh, Carolyn. I was yes. just look, I was just looking at where I thought there was the biggest disparity between the oh. two companies. And I thought it was payroll and rent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ex mm -hmm. exactly. This, payroll and rent. Mm -hmm. This is Waldo. One question you'd have to ask is uh, location of the store and size for footage wise, because that could affect your rent pretty significant, your rent and your insurance. However, the, the difference in payroll versus sales is, is huge. It's very it's huge, huge, right. So you guys are just jumping right on all the right questions. And so, you know, at the end of the day, um, store one is only spending 22 cents out of every dollars of sales on overhead. And store two is spending almost 59 cents. So, um, and obviously store two is losing money and store one is making money. But do you see how much insight that this gives you? Um, and even if we were just looking at sales dollars, it would give you some insight, but do you see how the added benefit of having those um, margin percentages there, that it opens up a whole nother level of information. So, what kind of advice if you if if this was a company and the owner came in and said well i have these two locations i let each manager kind of run with it and do whatever she wants what would you say to this business owner would we'll look at ways to reduce expense i i would incentivize the the manager like i would give them goals to get their costs down and then put a reward you know mm -hmm. To, the, to them for for making their store profitable. Right, right. And if, so and I would decide what's in their control and what's not in their control. They can't control what their rent is as a manager because you've probably signed that rent as the owner, right. but they can manage other parts. Well, right. They need, they I, need to I can negotiate though, you know, it depends on the, where they're at and what the conditions are. Mm -hmm. By looking at the percentage, I think the store too basically has a high percentage of cost good and also uh, a lot more payroll expenses in terms of percentage. So if this two figures can be reduced, it will really help with the, um, with the bottom line. Rent, like um, somebody said, you can't control it, right? Whatever rent district you sign it, it that's stuck. But the other is more like a variable expense. You can have a better control. Yeah. So you all are just doing a great job and you can see with a tool like this, how you could have a discussion. I mean, if we had the time, we could probably brainstorm a dozen different topics and strategies that you could review with the business owner based on this document. You know, um, what is the pricing differences? What are, you know, cause even the cost of goods sold is different. So what's going on there? You know, what's going on with offering discounts? What's going on? Why, why do you have four people instead of one? I mean, there's, there's so many things you could do here to have a discussion about how can I help this business owner get more profitable? And there's just really a wealth of information here on how to help them do that. And that's, that's what's really great about the margin analysis and the trend analysis is that you, it just opens up doors. Whereas if all these numbers were lumped together and we had no percentages and all we were looking at is the third column with no percentages, I think the, the business owner might be in the dark wondering like, well, I don't know why 
I'm losing, I'm only making $700 a month, you know, out of 27,000 or whatever it is. Yeah. $27,000 worth of sales. Um, so I think it, this is where the rubber meets the road and you get tremendous amount of insight. I, I have a quick question. Sure. So each industry in terms of profit margins are different, right? And like cost yeah. of goods are different too. Is there an industry standard we can find the percentage? You can. Um, Dun and Bradstreet and Robert Morrison Associates produce that kind of information and maybe some other companies do. The problem is I think the smallest uh, they have them organized by size of sales and the smallest level of sales is a million dollars last mm -hmm. time I looked at it. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a company like this that only has, you know, whatever, I don't know, $75,000 worth of sales or even $120,000 worth of sales, those margins change as a business gets bigger. And so I don't know how viable it is to compare a very small company to a million dollar in sale company. Um, plus those Robert Morrison, Dun & Bradstreet, I believe cost money to subscribe to. Uh, you'd have to look into that. But yes, once a business can scale a bit, there is industry information. And um, not that every business in every part of the country should adhere exactly to its industry standards. Um, it is sometimes a benchmark to say, wow, you're, you're paying, let's say more for rent here. Well, if you're a business in San Francisco, trust me, you are going to be over the industry average if you're paying for a commercial building because San Francisco is the most expensive real, real estate in the country. So it's not reasonable to think that their percentage on rent should be exactly the same, but at least you can do a pretty good comparison. But I think if you're in the market of helping micro business and, and very new small businesses, uh, I'd be open to knowing if there's information, but it's not really very cost effective for some company to gather information on those teeny weeny businesses. We use and, and with the retail business, you can calculate by per square footage sale, right? Sales per square footage. So even if you have high rent, but on the hand, your sales more, then that kind of evens out the as a benchmark in that sense. Yep. Wouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. Here in Wyoming, the Small Business Development Center have a, a subscription to what's called a biz miner report mm -hmm. and it uses IRS reported data so they can they can look at industries for your loca location on, a, on like a city or a county or a state basis or a regional basis and you can get that information through biz miner uh, if you know someone who subscribes to it. Great. Do you have the link for that? I do not. I always, I contact my small business development center and, and request that information from them. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. We have one more case study to go and we have 15 minutes. So if you look at the next sheet, you should have a sheet that looks like this. So this is a construction company. It's actually, uh, I got it out as it's a QuickBooks um, example company in my QuickBooks. Uh, my desktop, QuickBooks desktop thing. And what we can do with this is actually practice doing these percentages. So what I want you to do is using a calculator and, you know, pencil with an eraser is go ahead and start filling this in. This is a company, this is their January, this is their January to December uh, 16 P&L and then their January to December 2017 P&L. As you can see, look at their sales, went from 164,000 to 447,000. So we had a big jump in sales, but it's interesting. There's some other things that come to light when we do this analysis. So what I'd like you to do, and again, I think I'll put you in, I want to put you in small groups, maybe just for a few minutes, just to help everybody, is go ahead and start filling in the percentages here. Take 5,621 and divide it by 165,516 and put the percentage in this box. And then do the next thing here, 64,097 divided by 165,516 and put that percentage in this box. And just start marching your way through all these boxes and dividing every one of these numbers by the total sales for that year. And do the same thing over here, dividing by total sales for um, 2017. Okay, 
So let me put you in small groups again. Some people have a hard time with, you know, this and maybe if, if you feel there'll be someone in your small group that can help you. And I'll just do this maybe for four minutes or something, okay? So that we, um, just so people get a little help if they're wondering about how to do this. So just four minutes, just do, do as many as you can. And somebody was left here. I wonder why. Richard Morris. Hi, Richard. I don't know why you didn't get put into a room. I think Veronica just got got into the um, meeting right now. So she oh, was. She's been trying all this time. time. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Well, Sorry, yeah. Veronica. Yeah. So this was very short. I just wanted to make sure people could get through the numbers without feeling sometimes just basic division can be hard for people. Yeah. I think it is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it just depends. <laughs> it's like either you, it depends on your brain. Like, you know, poets, man, they just, the math thing, whatever. So. Yeah, yeah. Math, math is, doesn't come as easy to me as um, language or yeah. English language. And I think yeah. it's just how we're hardwired, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. So how many people do we still have with us? Do we lose a lot of people at, at two? Yeah, yeah, we had around, um, I think last time I checked, it was around 39 people. I can't really see right now because they're all in the yeah. breakout room. But right. yeah, we have about 10 minutes left too. Right. Mm -hmm. They should just have about three more minutes maybe um, in the breakout rooms and then they'll come back. Okay. And then I want to just go over this sheet with them and then also look at the, um, if, I, if I don't forget, the QuickBooks, show them how to do this in QuickBooks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I hope I don't forget to remind you. <laughs> just with, between us all, hopefully we'll remember. But yeah. at least people are talking. I'm really happy people are Yeah. Talking. Yeah. No, um, after the last exercise, people were excited about that PNL or or whatever it was. <laughs> Yes, um. the <laughs> yeah, sorry, I have I have a hard time following sometimes because I I still need to get the foundations down. Yeah. You'll uh, get there. You'll get yeah. there. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. That's really yeah, I mean you're you're on this like steep learning curve like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, somebody else is um this is so, in yeah, just let them in. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Go ahead and let them in. Let me know. Veronica, again. Oh, well, no, she's persistent. It's Larissa, actually. She, she, um, hi, Larissa. Hi. Wait, did you just, did you just sign on or were you in a breakout yeah, room? And then... the thing is that I'm having really bad connection oh, and oh. they're working on my internet here at home and I'm finally back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, Sorry luckily we we recorded the whole thing. So whatever you missed, you can watch if you want to. Oh, good. You guys are going to send that out. Yeah, it takes us a couple days usually to get it because uh, we have to download it and then ship it out, but we will get it to you. Oh, good. Okay, great. I'll be looking forward for that. Sorry, they're just working on my internet here at home. So it was just really a really bad connection for me. Yeah. Okay. I know that's frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we've got 10 more minutes if you just want to listen for a bit. Okay. The, the, the breakout rooms are going to end in about 30 seconds. So Oh, I, it told me to leave. It's okay. It doesn't matter. But I, 
I want to know how you go from zero payroll to 120. Thousand. Yeah, I know. So let's talk about that. <laughs> we think in 2016, we had a pandemic and nobody got paid. <laughs> I think you have very creative, creative ideas about how that happened. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go back on mute. Okay. Okay, welcome back everybody. Yes, I, it sounds like some of you got started. You probably didn't finish, but I can go. I have a completed sheet that I'm happy to go to and then we can discuss and do some analysis with. Were there any questions before I hop to my completed um, worksheet? Were, were people catching on on just how to do the math and fill it in, mostly? Okay, great, sounds good. So let me, let me go back to sharing my screen again and uh, So here are the answers or the answers I came up with for QRS Construction Company. And as some people said, uh, somebody dropped out of their, their little group more quickly, like this company has a big jump in sales and uh, a big jump in what else? What was the other thing that kind of popped out here? Insurance and payroll. Yeah. So we don't know what this company is about, but what story can you, would you guess about this company based on those two things, the jump in sales and the jump in payroll? That they're growing and expanding, so they needed to hire new people because their first payroll expense was zero. So they could kind of could have been bootstrapping themselves. And then, you know, once they were successful enough to hire themselves and put themselves on payroll, it was obviously going to be a significant jump. It could be that, right. It could be that in the first year, they were kind of just um, living off the, the net profit as a maybe slightly, I mean, this is a construction company, so chances are it's not a sole proprietor, but the guy was building the houses himself or the woman was building houses herself. And then instead of having just one job in the first year, she, she got four jobs or whatever in the second year and couldn't do them all herself and um, hired people. So let's, this is really interesting to look at because if you look um, at the percentage they brought down, as we look, just dropping down to net order, ordinary income at the bottom, in the first year, 2016, they were bringing 42 cents out of every dollar to the bottom line, which is actually rather amazing, and making almost $70,000. If you look at year two, they're only bringing 25 cents out of every dollar to the bottom line, but they're making more money by expanding and adding employees. They're actually making more net profit. So how would you guys assess this company? What would you say about this company or say to the owner? Keep I would it say, up. Yeah. I would say they're making an investment into employing their their employees so that they can do further expansion. Yeah, I would say exactly that. I would say this company is growing fast, had to add employees. And I don't know if anybody's worked with a business who's used to just paying themselves and then they add employees. Usually their pricing isn't set up well for employees and they lose money the first year they hire employees because they don't know how to manage salary versus pricing when they've used, they're used to just paying themselves. Whereas I would say this person is pretty successful. They added a lot of payroll, it grew, grew a lot, and are managing to still make more money. So I would say, wow, this is pretty good. You know, if you're working with a small business that's managing growth like this, I feel like you'd be happy. I'd be happy. So I have a, I have a question on that. Can, can sure. I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So why is the interest expense lower in the, in the, and the automobile expense the same? You would think with more business, they may have had just like a big project, a huge project. Right. There are, there you know, I'd have to dig into all the little, um, you, you know, can't, transactions. You can't make okay. And so I don't know the answer to that. This is, this is all QuickBooks data, so I don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. 
But I think what we're trying to capture here is the big picture about whether this company is succeeding and why, and what story can you tell about this based on your trend and margin analysis. That's kind of where we're going. And you're right, the, the numbers themselves beg more questions, but don't, don't lose sight of the big picture here. Even if there's something small here, that's like 4% of the total overall picture, overall this company is doing incredibly well managing growth, which a lot of companies don't. So that's a good sign. And what I did is create a little worksheet at the bottom of this where you can actually document um, you know, some of this stuff. So a change in sales, there's the formula for you. It's year two sales minus year one sales divided by year one sales their sales grew by 172%. So again, it's really nice to turn some of the dollars into actual um, percentages. I did the same with change in gross profit, change in net profit. Cost of goods as a percentage of sales is falling, which is a great thing. Profits are increasing, this is a great thing. They're managing growth well. And we don't have time today to go into it, but if you take the business, um, the micro lending essentials class and you learn how to like do global cash analysis and see if people can take on new debt. What you see down here is in year one, if this person was entertaining a loan that would have um, an annual debt service of 18,000, they really couldn't afford it, but they could take on a loan that had an annual debt service of 18,000 in year two and afford it. So there's just a sort of a wealth of information here that you can, um, again, use the PL to help you, um, you know, help you and your clients understand what's going on and give them way better advice than just kind of winging it from all the numbers mushed together or poor numbers or whatever. So I did want to um, show you that QuickBooks thing before we leave today and I can show you that but are there any other questions or comments people have do you feel like you kind of understand now how to take one of these documents and maybe turn it into a, a an enhanced tool to use with your with your clients yes great so let me take the minute just to show you that if you happen to get a client who is um on QuickBooks you can't QuickBooks does this for you and I'm assuming the other ones do it's like I said I, I'm not a bookkeeping expert, so I don't have every, um, yeah, so this is what I want to share is my QuickBooks. So what this is, is this is kind of the same company, you know, more or less. Uh, I think QuickBooks enhanced it because I just pulled it up today and I went, oh my goodness. So if you go to, um, I can just, let me close this here. So in QuickBooks, you go to reports and you go to company and financial, and then you go to profit and loss standard and click on it you get a profit and loss statement, which I will make bigger. And then there's a few things you can do to customize. I'm going to do hit this button called collapse because it just makes it um, a little cleaner. Then I'm gonna go up to customize report. And first of all, I just wanna change the font size because it's awfully small. So let me make it bigger. So now at least you guys can maybe see it, right? So this is just a two week P&L, which is like, uh, let me change this to year to date, fiscal year to date. So January through December, it's a whole year PL. And if you go to customize report up here, again, this is the desktop version of, of QuickBooks. It's not the online version. It's got this little thing here that you can say previous period and click that and it'll give you two years. It'll give you last year or next year. God, it has <laughs> 2021. I don't know how it got that, but in any event, it can put two years side by side for you, which is really nice. And I'm going to turn that off and just show you percent of income. So that's that little button right here, percent of income. And these are all those margin calculations done for you in QuickBooks. So it does uh, work for you, but it's always good to know how to do it yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, that is your PL analysis uh, with all the exercises for the day. I am uh, so happy to see all of you here and happy to answer any final questions or entertain any comments before we sign off. We're one minute over, but I'm happy to stay a few more minutes. That's very helpful. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My yeah, pleasure. Very good. The case studies and all. Yeah, and our case studies are what actually get it in the brain, right? It really helps yeah. to know how to apply yeah. it. Well, let me know how it goes. Yeah, you're welcome. Sounds like everybody's good with the class. Time to go do other things. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take, 
stay safe. We have a lot of thank you in the comment good. section too. Oh, too. good, good. Let me look at the chat box. Great. Oh, good. Good. Okay. We didn't really get a chance to talk about COVID, applying this in the COVID situation. I feel a little bad about that. It's a lot of a lot of stuff to go over. It was a lot of material, but you know, when you're trying to help people survive, I gave you some tools to help people survive. And so just do your best to like, see, how can I help people get more money to the bottom line, reduce expenses, pivot to something they can sell. These are some tools you can use the P&L for, which is what we're all trying to do now. All right. Bye everybody. Thank you. Do we need to do anything, Melissa, before we close the meeting? Are we good? I think we're good. Let me know if you want to share any of the resources, uh, any resources with um, with the group after. I'm going to send a follow up email. And I um, think my answer sheet for that very last case study would help people. Okay. Is, where so can I, I can, send that? I'll I'll email it to you right now. Okay. Okay. As soon as we get off, I'll email it to you, and then um, I think that's it. I think that's all. That's the only new thing I introduced. Yeah. Okay. Well, great All job, right. you too. All right, thank you. Talk Bye you now. Later. I'm going to end Bye. the meeting. Ciao. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Veronica.